Welcome to another episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. I want you to imagine for just a second that you're doing your job. Maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a producer, maybe you're a waiter, maybe you're a hairstylist, whatever you do. And suddenly some security guards walk in, maybe even some armed guards, and they say, we need you to leave. We need you to come with us. We need to go see your employer. No explanation, no nothing. Just before you know it, you're standing in front of your employer and you don't know why. And they ask you to pack up and leave. And you don't know why. And they refuse to tell you. We're going to hear from someone, a law professor, to whom this very scenario happened. That's coming up. Now, it's time for some sanity. It's the Michelle Tafoya podcast. So I asked you to imagine yourself in that position. Here's a, a, a an opinion piece from the Wall Street Journal by Scott Gerber. This is the gentleman whose whose rights were pretty much cast aside by his employer. Around 1 p.m. on Friday, April 14th, Ohio Northern University campus security officers officers entered my classroom with my students present and escorted me to the dean's office. Armed town police followed me down the hall. Picture that. My students appeared shocked and frightened. I know I was. I was immediately barred from teaching, banished from campus, and told that if I didn't sign a separation agreement and release of claims by April 21st, ONU, Ohio Northern University, would commence dismissal proceedings against me. The grounds? Collegiality. The specifics? None. Like many universities, ONU is aggressively pursuing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I have objected publicly as vice chairman of the university council, an elected faculty governance body, and in newspaper op-eds and on television to DEI efforts that don't include viewpoint diversity and would lead to illegal discrimination in employment and admissions. And this is pretty much what Scott Gerber thinks got him into hot water. We're going to meet him in a minute, but let me just give you the background on this guy. This is not just some law professor. Let me explain. Scott Douglas Gerber is professor of law at Ohio Northern University and an associated scholar at Brown University's Political Theory Project. He received both his PhD and JD from the University of Virginia. You know, that slouchy little university and his BA from the College of William and Mary, a similarly slouchy little university. He clerked for U.S. District Judge Ernest C. Torres of the District of Rhode Island and practiced with the Boston-based law firm Bingham, Dana, and Gould. He is a member of the Massachusetts, Colorado, and Virginia bars, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court bar. He is the 2002, 2009, 2011, and 2012 winner of the Fowler v. Harper Award for Excellence in Legal Scholarship and the 2004, 2013, and 2016 recipient of the Daniel S. Guy Award for Excellence in Legal Journalism. I could go on and on. I've got a highlighted page of achievements, uh, just outstanding Achievements. This guy has done so much in his profession. And I think maybe he disagreed a little bit with DEI on his campus or said, if you're going to do this, it's got to include diversity of thought. Oh, there was no room for that at Ohio Northern University. This gentleman is going to join us in just a moment. But first, some breaking news about Genucel. They have upgraded their most popular package to feature their top-selling deep-firming vitamin C serum plus ultra-retinol moisturizer with natural retinol alternative. This is big news. Right now, take advantage of this limited-time package upgrade for 70% off. Why waste time and money to get work done on your face when you can get Genucel skin care skincare delivered right to your door. Here is a Genucel.com review from Robert in Blessing, Texas. This is very sweet. Quote, I purchased Genucel as a gift for my girlfriend. 
She said she saw results so fast. So we joined their concierge program immediately. It's honestly the best skincare she's ever used and is extremely impressed with all the Genucel products. Her skin is noticeably softer and smoother. I can see and feel a difference too. She was already beautiful and Genucel has made her more beautiful. That's very, very sweet. Listen, I use the stuff. It, it changes things for the better. Genucel Secret is a family recipe for over 20 years that makes it safe for all skin types. It's perfect for both men and women. It's made by a compounding pharmacist in small batches and always safe, cruelty-free, and natural. So now go to genucel.com slash Michelle with one L and save over 70% off Genucel's most popular package featuring both the Genucel Ultra Retinol and the Genucel Firming Serum. Do not wait. Go to genucel.com slash Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-E. Genucel, that's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Michelle. Get a complimentary spa essentials box with every package order plus free upgrade to priority shipping. Genucel.com slash Michelle, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Michelle with one L. Coming up, Professor Scott Gerber, who was escorted out of his classroom in front of his students by campus security. Is he going to lose his job and why? Dr. Gerber, you've requested that I call you Scott, right? So I'm going to go ahead and do that if that's okay. Um, yes. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I just, I, I tried to impose to the audience uh, to, to, to put themselves in your position, to be at work on a normal day and have what happened to you happen to them. I'd like you to describe it from your viewpoint, just kind of what you were doing in class and, and what transpired. Okay. Um, well, it was my constitutional law class. It was Friday, April 14th. Uh, the class runs from noon until one. And just before one, when we were wrapping up, um, campus security, multiple campus security comes into the room and the the podium where I'm at is kind of downhill. The classroom kind of slopes a little bit down. And so they come down the stairs and one of them whispers into my ear something to the effect of, you're a, um, a respected member of the community. Please follow us quietly to the dean's office. And I, um, you know, I, I raised my eyes to the room and I saw the students and they looked confused and scared um, and I was uh, confused and scared. And so I followed them up the stairs and there were students in the aisle. And so I had to do sort of like a perp walk through them. And at the top of the stairs at the front of the door uh, were armed uh, town police. Um, and so they followed me down the hallway to the dean's office, to the dean's suite. And so when I got into the dean's suite, they escorted me into the dean's office. And out in the dean's suite, um, there were multiple campus security and armed um, town police guarding the door. And, um, and so when I got into the dean's office, you know, he uh, just handed me a, a, a document uh, and said that I had seven days to sign this uh, uh, release a claims document or he was going to um, uh, institute the dismissal proceedings, and I have tenure, and um, and he wouldn't tell me what I had done, you know, what specifically I had done, because I haven't done anything. I just do my job. I work hard on my teaching and on my writing, and I wake up early and go to bed early, all of that stuff. And, you know, I recorded the meeting. He knew I was recording it. So and recording on I your phone or... Yes, yes, ma'am. Recording it on my phone. And I asked him multiple times, you know, what am I alleged to have done? And he wouldn't tell me. And and so then he said I was immediately banished from campus. You know, I couldn't come on the campus. I had to give up my keys and my parking pass. And the uh, campus security escorted me back to my office, which is in the quiet side of the library. Um, and so I got a couple of things. I'm working on a book right now, reviewing the page proofs for it. And I grabbed those and that was, that was it. And then they walked me to my car. And then when I was at my car, um, the officer that was in the room with me and the Dean, 
you know, the officer heard me say multiple times, you know, what have I done? You know, tell me what I'm accused of doing. And he wouldn't do it. And so when I was at my car, the officer looked stunned also. Like he doesn't know what is going on. They wouldn't tell him what was going on. And um, he didn't know who I was and stuff like that. So that's basically it. It's 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 astonishing. Uh, I'm assuming nothing like this has ever happened to. Had you seen any other professor or employee at the university treated like this I- I before? Never. Um, and it sounds like, like you said, like the the university, the campus security was a little bit stunned as well. But to see armed town officers there. What what was, in addition to the question of what have I done, I, I'm trying to imagine your adrenaline and what was going through your mind and and a little bit of the how would you describe just your kind of your physical and and mental state at that moment? I was scared. <clears throat> um, it entered my head when they were walking me to the Dean suite that if I twitched or something, I might get shot. Literally that went through my head. Um, And it's funny because later on they denied that there was police there. But of course my lawyer has the, uh, the the police log. And so it says that they were there. The university asked that they come there uh, to help terminate a professor. And then there was a newspaper article a week ago, Monday, where they actually got a quote from the chief of the town police where he says, yes, the university asked him to send police to the, to the campus to do this. And yes, he did it. So they don't even tell the truth about it. This is extraordinary. Um, So that was April 14th. Was, what was your first instinct once you left campus? Was it to get a lawyer? What, What was your, what was your gut telling you you needed to do? And what did you do? Um, well, I, I, I know a lawyer in Cleveland, and I'm three hours from Cleveland. Eight, Ohio is just a little town in west central Ohio in the middle of nowhere. And so I contacted a lawyer named Michael Murray up in Cleveland, and he's still helping me. And so Michael started dealing with it for me. And, uh, you know, Michael had been dealing with it because way back in January, I got contacted out of the blue that they wanted to interview me and they wouldn't tell me why. And so but who wanted to interview I then you? contacted Michael and Michael started to, um, well, the first inquiry was from human resources. And so I, they, they would never say what it was about or why they needed to speak to me and all of that. So I wanted specifics Yeah, and they wouldn't provide them. And then, then, um, then uh, some outside law firm that the university had retained uh, contacted me directly. And when that happened, I reached out to Michael and Michael started dealing with the outside firm. And um, and so they had said it was voluntary and all of that. And they wouldn't tell me uh, what it was about. And to this day, I don't know what it was about. Multiple so, people. So I don't know what it was about. I still don't so know what it's about. I've given people your credentials ahead of you jumping on here so people know that you're you're no ordinary law professor. You're quite a decorated law professor. And so many groups have been coming to your defense, but this is, the, this is what, if I understand you correctly in January, when human resources reached out to you, they wouldn't tell you what it was about. And then this law firm that was doing some sort of um, look into this said your, your participation is voluntary, but they wouldn't tell you what it was about. And it seems to me if, if, if someone wants to talk to you, they need to tell you what it's about before you just go in and sit down and open yourself up to something. Am I am I right about that in a legal sense? Right. And and Michael Murray was dealing with the law, law firm. I didn't deal with them directly at all, but Michael made that clear to them. He said the most fundamental principle of due process is telling the person what he or she is alleged to have done wrong. They wouldn't even tell me that. They wouldn't give us copies of whatever it is. And, um, you know, so he said that we have to have that so I can prepare him and, and all of that. But they just, it's just surreal. And you, uh, so that's, go ahead. Uh, no, that's, it's, this is, it is surreal. It's, this is nuts. I, I'm wondering if you have an inkling 
what this may be about. Do you have a suspicion that maybe you have said, or, I mean, you write op-eds, you, you are out there in the public um, domain. Do you have an inkling of what this is? Yeah, the timing of it, I have a strong inkling. And uh, to, to, uh, I, the, the Wall Street Journal found out about this. And so they contacted me and asked if I would write a piece about it. And so I did. And of course, they're not just going to publish any thing. It has to be well written and documented. So they asked me for documentation. Good. Well, thank you. And so um, I, I I was vice chair of the university council, which is the equivalent of that vice president of the faculty. And our university, like so many now, is pushing this DEI material. And I objected to it. I simply said, don't forget viewpoint diversity, please. And they looked at me like I was from another planet. And I had previously, um, when they first started this, they established a DEI commission. And I read the report and the report had drifted over into illegality. It was things like, you know, we know we can't hire someone just because they're not a white male, but let's try it anyway, that kind of thing. And we know we can't have uh, scholarship funds set aside only for minority students, but let's do it anyway. We have one, let's do another one. And I pointed out to the president at the time, it's a different president now that that's illegal. And I've been on the Ohio Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights since 2008. So I know a little bit about that kind of thing. <laughs> and I pushed back on it. I said, you cannot do that, right? And it's, it's, and so they just want to do it. And um, I actually thought I was naive enough to think because um, as you kindly pointed out, my record is very good. I thought that would protect me with tenure and a record like I have that um, I could um, push back a little bit, especially since it's what's called protected activity. I'm allowed, you're allowed, anyone's allowed to object to illegality and not be retaliated against, but they did it anyway. So you said there was a different president back then when you first brought your concerns forward. We've had a change in presidents at the university. How, how might that have impacted this whole thing? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I've never, um, you know, if I have a major achievement, like my most recent book is being published by Cambridge University Press, which is quite good. Yeah. You know, I just mentioned that to her and she didn't respond and say, congratulations, nothing like that. The president that hired me two presidents ago, he would always respond and say, that's just terrific, you know, all of that. But um, so I think I was probably on her radar because I had been objecting to this kind of thing. And the year before all of that, we had a search process in the law school where we had six finalists and none of them were white men. And I asked, you know, how heavily are you taking race, gender, and ethnicity into account? And they wouldn't tell me. And then uh, finally, they admitted they took it into account. You're not allowed to take an account at all. In admissions, you can take it into account a little bit, although I think the Supreme Court's going to change that in, at the end uh, of yeah, June. Yeah, I agree. Right. Um, but in hiring, you can't. And so they did, and um, I objected, and they didn't like it. That's it. So you uh, are bringing forward some common sense objections and the non-commonsensical people at the top, and this is my wording, not yours, are taking it out on you. Interestingly, I've seen a couple of organizations really speak, in addition to the Wall Street Journal, inviting you to write this op-ed, and it's a tremendous op-ed. I read part of it in the open. DEI brings Kafka to my law school. It's, it's, it's so well written, and it, it's what grabbed me and made me want to have you on the podcast. But Fire, whom we've had um, on, on this show as well, uh, it, it, it's professor suspended for reasons unknown even to him. Why did Ohio Northern University suspend Professor Scott Gerber? We have no idea, and neither does he. And they go on to detail the story, and it's it's a it's a stunning account. And then the National Association of Scholars, uh, it's a letter in defense of Professor Scott Gerber. Peter Wood has written this. Uh, this is from May 18th, um, and he sent it to Melissa Bauman, the pr president of Ohio Northern University, where you were working, uh, in defense of of you. And they say the university has so far refused to explain to the professor what deed caused his banning and forced removal from campus. This is a clear abuse of process and of the professor's rights. Professor Gerber has detailed his experience in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, which we've notified. Um, so this group writes uh, on your behalf 
and, and in it says, <clears throat> he says, I'm appalled by the treatment ONU's senior administrators have meted out to Professor Gerber. His account published in the Wall Street Journal and the statement issued by FIRE are powerful indictments of the unfairness, callousness, and abuse of process that ONU has exhibited, I would say, in this case. But in fact, there is no case. As far as we on the outside can tell, there was only an admi only administrative whim. Uh, and he goes on, all stories have two sides. And I'm sure you have, quote unquote, reasons as someone who has dealt with academic freedom matters on many campuses over the course of three decades, I have heard numerous stories of academic administrators who have been, quote, fed up, unquote, with a faculty member who refuses to comply with what the administrator regards as a proper demand. Be that as it may, ONU has written rules and procedures laid out in its faculty documents. Your decision to bypass these rules and procedures was a mistake. Um, you know, I, I think this closing in this letter is so important uh, from Peter Wood, president of the National Association of Scholars, that I want to read it. I don't know what action Professor Gerber will take at this point, but I have my own sense of the right way this should be settled. You should apologize publicly to Professor Gerber and explain to your board that you made a grave mistake. Experience teaches me that these things are unlikely to happen, but now and then they do. And I urge you to be one of the exceptions who recognizes when she has erred. For my, my part, I will do what I can to keep public attention focused on your mistreatment of Professor Gerber. That will begin, but not end, by my making this letter public. So now you've got these organizations, these people in, in very good positions supporting you. Has the, has the dynamic changed at all? Are you sensing any change on the part of ONU? Uh, no. What I think the administration is uh, counting on is this will blow over. The news cycle will lose interest. And I think they're frankly shocked that I, it got so much attention. And I think it got so much attention because uh, the first reporting of it was in the most important non-left newspaper in the world, the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And then it just took off from there. And also the fact that armed police were involved. That's unheard of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so they're just counting on it blowing over and then they'll do what they want to do to me and hope that only my friends and family notice. That's what I think they're counting on. Can you sue? What What would you do legally? Yeah, um, uh, you know, that's expensive. And on that point, um, a, another friend of mine, uh, I don't even have social media, no Twitter or anything like that. So I don't even know how it works. But a friend of mine set up a GoFundMe page for my legal defense. And one of my students found out about it. And so he contributed $20. Okay. Oh. And so at, so at the barbecue, two days before commencement, and of course, I was banned from all of that. Um, the dean walks up to the student and says, um, I heard that you gave money to Gerber's GoFundMe page. That's pretty funny. And then he said that I can understand that you feel like you owe Professor Gerber because he practically wrote your paper for you. And what that comment was directed at, this student wrote a seminar paper in the spring of 2022. I thought it was so good that he should try to get it published. And I've only thought that in three out of four, four students in my 20 plus years. And so it got published. And then um, a few days before the barbecue, he was notified that it won a national award. So he, he won a national award, got $5,000, and then the university got $5,000 because our law journal published it. So instead of celebrating that young man's accomplishment, the proudest accomplishment of his academic life, the dean defames him in front of his classmates when he's trying to, you know, celebrate with, with barbecue. The dean walks up to him and says that to him. I was shocked by that. That is, that is shocking. Uh, it does sound like you have a lot of support. I hope that you don't let this just drop. This is, th this is part of so much of what we're seeing of people being denied their right to independent thought, debate, uh, civil discourse, um, disagreement. This is crazy to me. This is an absolute bombshell story in my mind. And if it had been at Harvard, 
you know, maybe more people would be paying attention, but it doesn't matter. You are the person going through this. In my eyes, you're a victim here. And I really hope that the legal community continues to step up for you. Um, we'll find the GoFundMe page. We'll post it for sure and, and let people know how they can help. I, I just, I guess I would finish with just kind of, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Cause this is a career and life changing event for you. Yeah, it, it, it's difficult. Um, I'm distracted occasionally by the page proofs to my book about law and religion in colonial America. And I'm sure you don't want to do a podcast with me about that because it's kind ah, of you never book. know. That sounds <laughs> okay. fascinating to me. <laughs> okay. okay. But, but so, Cambridge I'm, Press is sticking with you. Like they're not, they're not abandoning you on this book. Yes, I, I hope they stick with me. Um, but it's difficult because I have to figure out you know, what else I'm going to do for a living? Because if they go through with this and actually terminate me, and I'm, I'm essentially terminated on April 14th, um, you know, I need some way to pay the bills and have health insurance and things like that. And uh, so I have to think about that. Um, and I also have to defend myself when people ask me to, to do things like this. Uh, I, I do it. Um, so I'm just... I, I'm still just trying to make sense of it, really. Yeah, it's just, I, I, it affects I you. It affects, like, yeah. I can't even imagine how it's affecting you. Is your lawyer uh, still by your side helping you? Yeah, he's working with another lawyer called Robert Shibley. And Robert Shibley focuses exclusively, his law firm focuses exclusively on academic matters. And so Robert's taken the lead on this and... Um, you know, he, he's trying to make sure that that it works out as it should. And given how much ego is involved with most administrators, they never admit they made a mistake. They even claim that the armed police weren't there when the police log said they were. And the police chief gives a quote to the newspaper saying I, they are, you know, were there. Things like that. But that's what they do, because this is an easy thing to solve. They should give me, as Peter Wood pointed out. Uh, give me my job back, apologize to me publicly because they've defamed me in front of the whole yeah. campus. Yeah. Um, and then uh, hold whoever, whose idea this was, hold them accountable for it. Who was ever, and I have a couple of good ideas whose it was, but you know, I'm not going to say because I don't know for sure. Um, but whoever decided to do this needs to be held accountable for it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I it, This is common sense. This goes beyond just knowing the law and so forth. This is, this is so egregious. I'm so glad the wall street journal published your piece. I'm so glad fire is behind you. And I, I I'm so glad you're getting the support that you deserve and that you need. And I hope we can amplify your story just a little bit more. And I can tell other podcasters how to get in touch with you because this, this story needs to be told again and again and again, because it could happen to other people. And, and this, this is, it's crazy to me, absolutely crazy to me that this is happening. So I, I wish you well. Uh, you have whatever support we can give you. And certainly uh, I would direct our listeners to your to your GoFundMe and, uh, and, and, and just to, to support you in any way possible. Thank you so much for coming on with me today. I, I really appreciate it. I just I wish you well. Please know that you have probably more support than you realize. Well, thank you, uh, Michelle. And as I mentioned, when you invited me, it's it's a it's an honor and a thrill uh, to be interviewed by you. I never th thought in my wildest dreams that one day I'd be interviewed by someone like you. Well, um, it, you, I, it used to happen on, you know, on like the 50 yard line or the 20 <laughs> yard line of a football field. Here we are. We're on a kind of a connection. But uh, it's I'm um, the honor is mine because these are the stories that matter so much to me. And uh, so just know that you have our support. Please know that. Thank, thank you. He is Scott Gerber. And as I say at the end of every podcast, like Scott, like the professor here, uh, be brave and do good. Check out his GoFundMe page. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.